Let's stand to our feet. Yes. Hallelujah. Grab your Bibles as you're standing. Hold them up in the air. We're going to make our confession. Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. My Bible is, my Bible is the Word of God. The Word of God. And God's Word God's is word. devil destruction power. Devil destruction With my Bible, power. I can defeat the devil defeat every, every single day. This is my Bible. My Bible is the Word of God. And God's Word God's is the revelation is the of His will for my life. For Whatever it says I am, what that's what I am. Whatever it says I can do, I can do it. Whatever it says I have, I claim it in Jesus' name. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to hear your word, to teach your word, and to preach your word. Now help us to be doers of your word and listeners in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Yes. We're, one of the things we're trying to do is get a video camera and um, an internet service so y'all keep praying for that so that we can start you streaming. But, th but we'll create the videos this way right now. Um, turn with me in your Bibles to Jude chapter 1 verse 7. We're going to continue talking, start talking from last week about homosexuality and God's judgment. This is part 2 of the lesson we, we began last week. And this is um, part 5 of our social issue series. But um, last week we dealt with a number of things. If you don't know exactly what we dealt with, you probably should get the, um, the audio file or watch the video on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, um, LinkedIn. I I've, I've got that video in so many places, you just can't miss it no matter where you go. Praise God. Mm -hmm. So um, if, you, if you really want to grasp what we talked about last week, watch the video. But basically what, uh, we talked about the fact that God um, is not angry or offended with homosexuality. It's the, the problem with homosexuality is that it is not in accordance with God's intended order and that is what is destroying those who are engaged in it. Amen. Amen. Now yeah, God gets angry at sin but not for the reasons that we purport. See, we make, we make it look like God is offended that because, just because we did him wrong. But God gets angry with sin because of what it does to the person who's sinning and to others around them. Amen. Amen. You know, I get angry with people who smoke around me. I really do. Because not only does it affect that person, but it's affecting me. Yes. And, that, and, and it's so uncourteous for you to sit around with that cigarette blowing smoke in my area, in my personal space. But it's the same thing. God gets offended not so much with you having fun or, or seeking out pleasure, but the fact that the pleasure that you're seeking out is not only destroying you, but destroying others. Glory to God. Amen. AIDS, for example, started in the homosexual community. And but the problem with that is it didn't limit itself to the homosexuals. Those innocent kids had to get AIDS because either they were born with parents who had AIDS or blood transfusions because some inconsiderate person who had AIDS donated blood and, some, and because of a blood transfusion, somebody else who didn't even engage in homosexuality got AIDS, praise God. So AIDS is destroying our society, and but it started with the act and the sin of homosexuality. Praise God. All right. Amen. So, um, let's go over real quickly some of the things we talked about. We learned that, that God is not wanting to kill homosexuals out of anger or, or out of his wounded ego. That's not the way God is doing it. But the problem is that Satan, Satan has led people to believe this type of thing about God, and that's why so many people reject God because they think that God is just sitting in heaven with this big hammer just wanting to bop people because they've been sinning. And, and you know, nobody wants to serve a God like that so they rebel against him more. But God is loving and he's concerned about those who are, who are in sin and he's trying to keep people from destroying themselves. Praise God. Amen. 
And the other, and we learned that sin and perversion has a, an effect on the very land. We looked at um, Leviticus chapter 18 and chapter 20, and we saw that because of the perversions of, the, of those Canaanites, their bestiality, their homosexuality, and their other sins, that the land itself was going to vomit them out. So God had to send the Israelites in there to get rid of them before they really destroyed that land. Praise Jesus. Amen. And the, the other thing we learned is that God had um, a natural intended order for relationships that homosexuality distorts. Glory to God. And there are consequences that come when you go against the natural intended order that God had placed in the first place. Hallelujah. So it's not always so much that God is punishing you when you sin. God didn't, he didn't put AIDS on the earth. That's not God. AIDS came because of sin. Hallelujah. There was a, the, the natural order was, was distorted. And so distortion caused something to happen. It's just like I said last week. If I put sand and milk in my car, it ain't going to work. Hallelujah. The natural intended order for my car is gas and oil, not sand and milk. I can't, if I put sand and milk in my car, in my gas tank, I'm not, I cannot sit there and get mad at God. God, why did this happen to me? It's funny the things we blame God for, ain't it? Well, I tell you, we, we are some silly people. But anyway, the consequences for sin are, the, are um, come about naturally because they are a distortion of the way that God intended things to work. And homosexuality is just one of many distortions. Why do, or are we dealing particularly with homosexuality and not with other sexual sins? Because that is what's prevailing in our society right now. We are, the, people are trying to force us to endorse homosexual marriage. People are trying to force businesses of Christians to condone this. They are telling um, people who bake cakes that they have to bake a homosexual cake, a homosexual wedding cake. That photographers, Christian photographers, have to photograph homosexual weddings. And these guys are nothing but activists. They are trying to destroy the Christian community because you could easily find a photographer or a baker mm -hmm. who don't care about that stuff. Mm -hmm. But they, they intentionally target Christians to try to destroy them. And see, this is a war. The, the whole thing is really a war between God and Satan. Praise God. Amen. Satan is trying to destroy God's church and he's, and he's trying to persecute the church and he's using the homosexual agenda to do it. Now, you and I are not to hate the homosexual, praise God. We are to love them. However, Christians, many so-called Christians are going to the extreme. Whereas at one time the church was on the extreme of almost hatred of homosexuals and, and condemning them and, call, and calling down God's judgment upon them, now, many in the church have gone to the other extreme of acceptance. Well, there's nothing wrong with really being gay. And you got books out now that, that, tr that tell you that the Bible does not teach against homosexual marriage. That's crazy. Because the Bible is plain and clear that homosexuality is a sin and an abomination. Glory to God. Amen. And you shouldn't... See, so the reason why we're having to teach this is so that you don't get influenced by the culture of today. Jesus is coming back real soon, praise God. And there's going to be a lot of people going to find themselves left behind. I don't want Victoria's word left behind, praise God. I don't want Pastor Troy to be left behind because I failed to teach y'all the truth, amen. amen. Glory to God. Now, let's look at um, Jude chapter 1 verse 7. I'm going to read this from the King James Version first. It says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Say strange flesh. Strange flesh. Are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now let me read that from the God's Word translation. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities near them is an example for us of the punishment of eternal fire. 
The people of those cities suffered the same fate that God's people and the angels did because they committed sexual sins and engaged in homosexual activities. Praise God. Amen. So the strange flesh, I, I, I really like the King James versions way better, but I needed to give a modern translation so we can clarify exactly what it means by strange flesh. Strange flesh is homosexual act. The Bible says it is a strange thing, praise God. Amen. The reason why it is strange is because it is outside of God's intended moral order. The way he made things. Last week we showed you that God created them male and female. Hallelujah. Amen. In other words, as the old saying goes, God created them as Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve. Which I know that Pastor Steve is very happy about. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. So God did not create for men to be with men or women to be with women. Hallelujah. He created for men, for man and a woman to marry and then um, engage in the, in the sexual act. Glory to God. Amen. Sex is a beautiful thing. Hallelujah. It's a pleasurable thing. It's a wonderful thing. It is not dirty. God created sex. Amen? Amen. God created sex and he expected it to, to, to be enjoyed within the confines of marriage because sex outside of marriage, whether it's even between a man and a woman, will hurt you. Hallelujah. Amen. I know that for sure because I engaged in sex outside of marriage and I regret it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I, I'm so glad that God redeemed me from, from the things that, that, that you know, the, the soul ties and all the other things that, that affected me because of that. But sex within marriage is a wonderful thing. But homosexuality, there's no such thing as a man marrying a man. You can't do it. That's not the way God intended it. Man seems to want to distort the way God did things because man is being influenced by the devil. But the thing, the, the, the main thing I want y'all to get is the, what we talked about last week is the consequences of sin because I want you to understand the character of your God. The character of your God is love. He's not a vengeful God. He's not trying to destroy people. So you got this, so I'm, I'm trying to help you to understand why God is so against homosexuality. Why, is he, why does he want to stop it? Why does he want people to, to stay within the, the intended moral order? Because it will destroy them. Now, so we looked at that last week, but then the question came up. At least I brought the question up because I know it was in some of y'all minds. Well, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Didn't God personally destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? How many of y'all believe he did? All right. Well, maybe I might give you a different purview. Now, you don't have to accept my purview, but just listen, just hear me out, all right? Because I'm going to give you a, 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 an understanding of how Scripture needs to be interpreted. But there's nothing wrong with you believing that way because the Bible basically says it that way. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 24 through 25, it says, Then the Lord rain upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities with that which grew upon the ground. It says the Lord did it, don't it? Doesn't it say that? Exactly. Don't it say it? Yeah, it said, don't be afraid. I'm, I'm not, it's not a trick question. It's plain and clear. It says that the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from out of heaven. But let me ask you a question. In the book of Job, when the fire came down upon Job's property, and somebody came to him and said, the fire of the Lord came down and destroyed all your property. Did that fire come from God? Did it come from God? But the Bible plainly and clear says that the fire of the Lord came down, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Those of you who read your Bibles, <laughs> it says the fire. And now, that's not, on, that's not even it. When you go 
into, as you read further into the book of Job, God actually takes the blame. In Job chapter 2, he says, the thing, you, you, you caused me to do the Job. And then you go to um, Job chapter 42, and then it says that Job's um, friends and family came to him to comfort him because of all the evil that the Lord had done to him. Doesn't it say that? But when we read Job chapters 1 and 2, who do we find that was actually doing all those things to Job? Satan. Say it again. Satan. Right. So what I'm trying to teach you is a, a particular way of biblical interpretation that actually helps you to understand the character of God and how, how you are to understand the Bible so that God does not look like the monster that he's always been made out to be. Let, um, let me give you a quote by numer one of numerous scholars that I have sought out on this. See, I didn't come to these conclusions by, I, I, it's taken me over almost close to 30 years of studying this stuff out before I came to many of the conclusions I'm about to give you today. Praise God. Right. I, now, I haven't often preached on this because people can't receive it. But let me read this quote to you. It says, this is from um, a book called When Bad Things Happen, God Still Loves. Um, it says, he said, God does not create destructive judgment. He simply allows people the judgment that they have made for themselves. What we what do we do with Old Testament passages of scripture that seem to present God as destructive? In some cases, Old Testament writers and prophets did not bother to distinguish between what God did as an action of love and what God allowed to happen as the result of human choosing and action. The Hebrew mind at times attributed everything to God without bothering to distinguish between permitted judgment and the active judgment of God. Praise God. And let me give you another example from the Bible itself. And you don't have to turn to turn there. You can, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, it says that God moved or tempted David to number Israel. Praise God. In other words, and then after that, God gets angry with David for doing what the Bible says God tempted him to do. And God punishes all of Israel for what God tempted or moved David to do. Do you believe that God causes you to sin? Come on, be honest. Do you believe God causes you to sin? No. Good. But that's what the um, Second Samuel chapter 24 verse 1 says. It said that, da that God made David sin. And then God punished him for making David sin. Now Calvinists will tell, will, will believe it just like it's written. <laughs> but most of us who got enough sense should know how to study the Bible. And remember, remember there are no contradictions in the Bible. Praise God. Whatever appears to be a contradiction is actually a clarification. Now when you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 1, it says that Satan moved David to number Israel. Praise God. It says that Satan was the one who did it. Second Chronicles chapter 21 verse 1 is simply um, a repeat of 2 Samuel 24 1. And then when you go to James chapter 1 verse 13 it says that God does not tempt anyone with sin. Hallelujah. So either there's a contradiction or a clarification. I believe that it's a clarification, glory to God. Why? Because God speaks within, within the language of the people, hallelujah. As the, God, the man said that um, the Hebrew mind believed a certain way. And see, um, God commun he communicates his, his word in the language of the people at that time. And then he used their particular idioms. And he always explained and identified things either within the context of the passage, if the scripture, or with other scriptures. Now, what is an idiom? It's not an idiot, an idiom. For example, here in America, 
you know, for, especially those of us from the ghetto or from um, from the hood, we used to call, we used to say, when we like something, we say, man, that is the, the bomb. That is the bomb. Now, if you translate it, what I say, when I say, man, my wife is the bomb. If you translated that into a, diff, a foreign language, what, literally, without explaining the idiom, what would you get? Yeah, you, you would, my, you, it would say, he is married to a bum? <laughs> Something's wrong with that. It, here's another, here's one we, just about everybody uses. Man, Pastor Steve is the coolest person I know. Now, if you, um, you translate that into a literal, different language, literally, you would think, well, he must be sitting under the air conditioner all day long because he's cool. <laughs> no, but we know that that doesn't mean that. That means he is, he, he's, um, he's smooth, he knows what he's doing, you know? Or, here's, the, uh, here's one we used to use when I was kids. Man, that dude is bad. You know, if he's playing basketball, he can jump and hoop and, and do all that stuff. We would say, man, he is a bad dude. Now, he may be the sweetest, nicest guy in the world. He probably walks little old ladies across the street. He stops crying. He, he helps the, the, the poor and the needy. But when you translate, man, that dude is a bad dude into a different language, somebody's going to get something different than what you really mean, praise God. Amen. But what we meant was that he is pretty, he's good at what he's doing, hallelujah. Yeah. So that's how we understand idioms in different languages, and that's how we need to understand the Bible. The Bible often is, the idioms are not explained thoroughly when it's translated from the Hebrew or the Greek into the English language, praise God. Yeah. So, that, so often when God is said to have done something, it usually means that he lifted up his hand of protection and allow things to happen. And that, now let me show you how that um, connects to Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. In Genesis chapter 14, um, verses 8 through 10, you know, um, you can also read the, the first couple of verses in your own time. But it says, And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma. No, remember the words Adma and Zeboim. All right? Y'all keep those two names. The two cities in mind. And the king of Bala, the same as Zor. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim. With Shedelamor, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shana. Ooh, these are some hard words to pronounce. And Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings with five. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to verse 10. It says, and the veil of Sidon was full of slime pits. Say slime pits. Slime pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. The, the key, the, uh, that area in which Sodom and Gomorrah were at was full of slime pits. Now, I looked up some archaeological stuff. Let me, let me turn to it. I don't want to read all of it, but it says what would cause every structure in the cemetery to be destroyed in this way. It's talking. To, this is a guy who went over to um, the area where Solomon and Gomorrah was at. And he says, the answer to the mystery is found in the Bible. Then the Lord rained down, say rained down. Rain down. He rained down burning sulfur on Solomon and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. The only conceivable explanation to this unique Discovery in the annals of archaeology is that burning debris fell on the buildings from the air. But how could such a thing happen? There is a simple evidence of sub subterranean deposits, listen to this, a petroleum based substance called bitumen, similar to asphalt in the region south of the Dead Sea. Such material normally contains a high percentage of sulfur. It has been postulated by geologist Frederick Clapp that the pressure from the earthquake could have caused the bitumen deposits to be forced out of the earth through a fault line. As it is gushed out of the earth, it could have ignited a spark or surface fire. It would then fall to earth as a burning fiery mass. Is there any evidence for the biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction by fire and brimstone? That's it. Sulfur. Praise God. Amen. The slime pits 
were already there. What God was doing, because the Bible says that He upholds the work, the um, He upholds the world by the word of His power. He protects and He keeps things from happening. Glory to God. Amen. But what happens is, is people continue to sin and continue to sin and they continue to mess up the land and. So, and little by little they keep telling God we don't want nothing to do with you and so God has no other choice but to back off and remove his protection if you remember when you read Genesis chapter 18 he tried his best not to have to destroy that city he let, he let Abraham talk him down to, to 10 people hallelujah so I mean he, he could have just said hey you know what forget what Abraham thinks let me just go in and destroy it but God is not like that he, want, he doesn't want to destroy it but that's why you see that God was trying, was protecting that city and keeping it from destruction. But they didn't acknowledge God, and they continued to live in sexual sin. And so, um, there's another archaeological discovery. I won't read that one, but that, um, matter of fact, I could have put plenty, uh, uh, quite a number of these same discoveries out. So I'm just going to read one to you because I don't want to bore you with a whole bunch of big words. But uh, if you ever want to get the video, you want a copy of, of, of my notes or whatever, I will give this to you. But I want you to understand that those slime pits that surrounded Solomon and Gomorrah were already ready to burst, go up in the air, and rain down fire upon those cities. The only thing that was keeping it from happening was God's protection over the city. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And, and, and let, me, let me confirm this with one more scripture because y'all should, should never accept what I say. You should accept what the word of God says. Praise God. This may all be new to you, but, um, but all, always keep in mind the word of God. If, if, and don't reject what I say right out. Um, look at the scriptures I'm, I'm giving you and then study them out. But in um, Revelation, it talks about how there are angels that are holding back the, the four winds of strife. And God tells them, don't release those winds yet until all of the saints have been sealed and then once the protection of the saints have been sealed then the angels release the four winds and then all the bad weather and all the catastrophes start coming upon the earth praise God Amen. but see what, what, what God was doing he had angels holding back the bad weather until such time as all the saints have been taken care of and moved out of the way and then he allowed all the bad weather to come, or in other words, he removed his protection from the earth. Praise God. Amen. And so, again, that's how we conclude where it talks about that the land vomited its inhabitants. See, God upholds things by the word of his power. He keeps things from happening. All the destruction that's coming upon the earth is not so much God sending tornadoes or God sending earthquakes. It is because people are rebelling against God and, and telling God, we don't want no more to do with you. Leave us alone. And so God can't stay where he's uninvited. Hallelujah. Amen. But if you move God out, you also remove his protection from you. Praise God. Amen. If, if I'm guarding your house and I'm keeping burglars from your house and you tell me, Troy, you keep smacking me aside by head saying, get out of here. We don't want you around. Sooner or later, I'm going, I'm going to get enough kicks in the butt and I'm going to leave. Praise God. Amen. And then when I leave and take my gun with me, the burglars got free access to your house, don't they? Yes. Well, the same thing with God. You keep telling that this country, the United States of America, with all of its endorsement of, of, of abortion and homosexual rights and stuff, continually tells God, we don't want you. Removing prayer from school. We don't want you, God. Telling, we, telling us we can't pray in public places anymore. We're telling God, leave us alone. That's why this country is in trouble, praise God. Amen. But God, the reason why, the only reason that the United States has not been destroyed yet is because God still has a remnant of people here who love him and who are praying for this nation. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, let me show you something else. Let's go back to Solomon and Gomorrah. I, I want to show you another scripture that really makes this point. And remember, remember those cities, Adma and Zor? Y'all remember those cities that were connected to Solomon and Gomorrah? All right, let's look at Hosea chapter 11. 
Now, in Hosea chapter 11, verses 8 and 9, I, I, I did a bunch of bolding and highlights because I'm trying to make a point. It says, how shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboim? See, Adma and Zeboim were connected to Solomon and Gomorrah. What happened to Adma and Zeboim? God gave them up, praise God. My heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. The way God destroys is by giving people up. Praise God. Amen. The way God destroys is by saying, okay, y'all don't want me no more. I'll, I'll deliver you over to the hands of your enemies. That's how God dealt with Solomon and Gomorrah. He gave them up. That, remember what the angels said to, um, to Lot when they were trying to get him out of the city. He said, we can't do anything until you leave. Those angels were holding back the destruction until Adam, I mean, until Lot and his wife left. Praise God. Amen. They were keeping that city protected, but it was. But once they, once the folks wanted to rape them, it was time for them to go and let them have let the city be destroyed. So, as we noted, Adma and Zeboim, they were in the same region, and they suffered the same fate because of the uh, slime pits that were there or the petroleum pits as we know them as of today. And so we see that God's method of destruction is to remove his hand of protection or to give the person up to the consequences of their sin. Glory to God. Alright. Um, let me show you a couple more scriptures. You, you know, y'all be patient because this is new to you. This is some new teaching to, to, for most of you. So, um, so y'all be patient. Let me give you a couple more scriptures to prove this point. Because everything that I teach you should be based on the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, if it's my personal opinion, if it's Pastor Troy's personal opinion, please reject it. But if it's God's word, you need to see it. You need to see the puzzle pieces put together. Hallelujah. Amen. Have you, how many of y'all have ever you, um, put a jigsaw puzzle together? I've done it. You don't get the whole picture while, you, while the pieces are still apart, right? You got to put the whole thing together before you can see the whole picture. That's what we have to do with the Bible sometimes. The, the Bible is just sometimes like a jigsaw puzzle. You got to put all the pieces in place before you get the full picture about God. Glory to God. Amen. All right. So let's look at um, how. Let's look at again uh, about how God's wrath or how His way of destruction is done. If now. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, ignore that Hosea. Uh, that was a mistake on my part. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed. Say revealed. revealed. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, how is that wrath revealed? You read on down in Romans chapter 1. And verse, beginning at verse 24, it says, therefore God also Gave them up. Say, gave them up. Gave them up. Now, this is how God's wrath is revealed. He gives people up to the consequences of their sin. He gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And we jump down to verse 26. It says, for this cause, God, say, gave them up. Gave them up. He gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. In other words, that's talking about lesbianism, praise God. Amen. Jumping down to verse 27, it says, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Talking about homosexuality. Men with men working that which is unseemly. And look at this, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. In other words, Receiving the consequences of violating God's intended order. Praise God. Amen. And then we go down to verse 120, verse 28, and it says, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. Say, gave them over. Gave them over. To a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Praise God. Amen. So God gave them up. Gave them over. 
just like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. He gave them up, praise God. He allowed the situation that um, to just, well, explode. <laughs> Pun intended. But he allowed the, um, the earthquake to, to happen and it brought up the petroleum, which, which ignited fuel and exploded and burnt and it came down all upon those houses. And so God is credited with having rained down fire from heaven upon that city. Praise God. Amen. So are y'all getting this? Yes. All right. I, if you need to study this more again, you can have copies of the notes. Get the video. I'm planning on writing a book dealing with all this stuff one day. But um, a couple more things that we're going and then we're going to pray and, and pray for y'all. Have an altar call, whatever. Um, but remember that Satan is always distorting and perverting God's original intent. And that's what the whole thing, whole problem God has with homosexuality. And Satan hates you and he hates God. And he's trying to destroy you, not because he has any personal vendetta against you. He just hates God. You've been created in God's image, so he hates you now. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so what the way, the way to get you, he can't. See, if Satan could have killed you, he would have killed you a long time ago. He can't do it. So the only way he can get you to do it is to sin against God and, and, put, and, and keep putting yourself in the position to where finally God has, to, has no other choice but to say, okay, I have to turn you over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh because you just keep sinning. Praise God, because mm -hmm. he's going to allow you to the, the, um, he's going to allow you to follow the master that you want to follow, and then receive the consequences that you. But God is so merciful; he he spends years protecting us from the results of our own sin, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Oh, David said he has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. Wow, what a good God! Amen. How the Holy Spirit continues to put up with us. We do stupid stuff, and he. And, and he still snatches out of the hand of the enemy. What a good God. Amen. One more scripture and we get ready to close out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 8 through 10. And this is the God's word translation again. I love the God's word translation. It's, it was my devotional Bible for a long time. But instead, verse 8. Instead you do wrong and cheat and you do this to other believers. Don't you know that wicked people won't inherit the kingdom of God? Stop deceiving yourselves. There's a lot of people deceiving themselves today. A lot of people in the church are deceiving themselves. People who continue to commit sexual sins, who worship false gods, those who commit adultery, homosexuals or thieves, or those who are greedy or drunk, who use abusive language or who rob people, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Praise God. Why? Not because God doesn't love them. He loves them. But he, he's got to protect the rest of us. Hallelujah. Amen. If he lets rob, pe robbers and homosexuals and people into the kingdom, they're going to keep doing what they're doing. And pretty soon they'll destroy God's kingdom like they're destroying the earth right now. So God can't let them enter in. Now you can enter into the kingdom of God by simply being born again and repenting and changing your life. Praise God. Amen. The homosexual, there's hope for the homosexual. God loves the homosexual. God loves the adulterer. He loves the fornicator. He loves the robber. He loves everybody. But you can't enter into the kingdom of God under those if you're still conditioned to do sinful acts. Praise God. Mm -hmm. If I if if we let robbers into heaven, they'll be stealing the streets of gold. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, you'll be like, what? What happened to the streets? <laughs> <laughs> we can't let God can't have robbers in there. Praise God. So, so we, <laughs> let me end here by um, reading to you a statement that I wrote. It says, There is an ongoing warfare between two kingdoms God's kingdom of love, life and light, and Satan's kingdom of death, destruction, darkness, and deception. If we choose by our lifestyle to follow the dictates of Satan's kingdom, then we will go where he is going. Praise God. Amen. God doesn't want that and offers a kingdom and freedom from Satan's destructive ways. Homosexuality is destructive. If we choose this lifestyle, we have chosen which kingdom reigns over us. And we will remain in that kingdom even upon death. Praise God. Amen. The kingdom that you choose 
to live in. The kingdom that you choose to have authority over you is the kingdom that you stay in forever. Until you, after you're dead, you're still going to be in that kingdom, except that kingdom will be experienced in hell for all eternity. You don't want to burn for all eternity. Praise God. Amen. I put my finger over, over a little light one time, and that hurt uh, bad enough. Now you imagine being engulfed in flames forever and ever with no relief. That's what's going to happen to the per person who continues to practice homosexuality and will not repent in other sins. Praise God. Amen. So th this is my call to those of you who are homosexuals. And if you are listening to this, you are watching us by television. You are watching us by YouTube or Facebook or any of the other medias. I want you to know we love you. We don't condemn you. But we have to tell you the truth. And, you, and if you don't get out of your sin, you're going to die. And you're going to burn in forever in hell. You may not like my message. You may be angry with me. You may persecute me. But I have to tell you the truth. I am obligated by the Spirit of God to tell the truth. Praise God. I, ha I have to. Not just out of fear of going to hell, but because I love you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I love homosexuals. I love them. But they've got to repent or else they're going to die in their homosexuality. Praise God. Amen. All right. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Did you get anything out of this today? Yes. Did you learn something new? Yes. Glory to God. Well, I want to invite those who are watching by um, television or by computer to Victoria's Word Christian Fellowship. We are at 11 George Street, the second floor in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Our services start at 1130. Our number's up on the screen. Also, visit us on our webpage at www.victoriaswordchurch.org where we have many um, free books and free audios that you can listen to. God bless you. We love you. And Victoria's Word said... Amen. Amen. Victoria's word said again. Amen. Glory to God. Stand to your feet. Praise God. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Let bow your heads, close your eyes. Glory to God. Father, we thank you.